And so it's always good to just uh, beware. But I don't think that this is a particularly big bull. You will find uh, that the more dominant males will be in the bigger dams with all the pods of females or rafts of females. And you can see he hasn't got anybody accompanying him at the moment. So he might be a youngster. He does, like I say, he doesn't actually look particularly big and he looks like he's in good nick too. I haven't seen too many scratches on his body just yet. And you can also gauge sort of just how beaten up a hippo is, whether it's um, been given a hiding by, of course, an adult. But sometimes the older bulls tend to have some serious scars and he's got a couple on him. But I don't know how many battles he has faced. And perhaps if he has been in a battle being younger, he probably would have been chased away by some of the big ones before getting injured. And the animals out here, they don't want to end up uh, in, a, in a position where they could potentially lose their lives. So when fighting does occur, it's, it's serious. It means business. They're not just doing it for fun. Are you going to roll over for us now? He looks like he wants to. You can see his side just slowly turning to the right. And I love it when a hippo does a full rollover and exposes their feet. And at this time of the day, we could potentially see this chap get quite playful. I actually think we've seen him out of the water before. I was telling David that I found that sneaky road that um, should have joins from Parallel Road just uh, north of here. And we took it. There must have been a sighting down here at one point. And we'd seen him out and grazing out of the water. Some of you may uh, remember that. And I, I think it was the same boy. I can't tell for sure. But uh, just because of the area and then sort of once there, once there is enough water around like there is at the moment, they will sort of stay in one spot like we've seen at Bifulsuk Dam and at Twin Dams. We've got our regulars who have occupied those watering holes and I don't think that he would want to give up this little pan very easily. I think he would try and chase off some other young bulls too. But it's beautiful this afternoon. It's very peaceful. You know what I am missing though is I'm definitely missing the kingfishers. And we have seen a little little pygmy kingfisher here before, but unfortunately not this afternoon. But that's lovely. Here's some little rattling cysticulars. I could also hear a turtle dove. Very, very subtle sounds in the bush this afternoon, but that's of course going to turn into a big chorus. But we're going to head from this dam, we're going to start going all the way down to the southwestern corner. James is now playing with a beetle. I am playing with the beetle, and I'm most impressed that that was between Taylor and the final control they managed to identify it. It is the great demon beetle of uh, Juma. I say that it is the great demon beetle because it's got black demonic eyes. Uh, long horns, and it is a form of long horn beetle. But isn't it amazing? Now, what I want to do is put it in front of the microscope for you, because I promise you, if you look into those eyes through the microscope, I think that you'll be terrified for weeks afterwards. I'm focused on your eyes. You're focusing on my eyes, are you? Thank you. Thank you very much. Not my eyes, my eyes are angelic. But the eyes of this chap... Not so much. Isn't he wonderful? I wonder if he would like to hang around for television. He does. He's good at hanging, at any rate. All right, let's take him inside and put him onto the microscope. <laughs> Slightly like I've been possessed. <laughs> Sorry, let's take him inside. <laughs> He's been, you know what, he sat still for about 10 minutes while Taylor was looking at the hippos, and now, of course, he is becoming very mobile. Now, let's see if we can get him just to sit still long enough for us to make him look into the microscope. No, no, you're going to need to sit still. Sit still. Sit still. Please. Just briefly. Just a few seconds. That's it. That's it. Oh, no. No. He's, he's really not being very confiding. Stop now. Hang on. Let me put him on my stick. He stood on the stick. He managed to sit still on the stick for a little while. That's it. 
Where are you going? You see, you've got nowhere to go. Just sit there. Sit there. No, man. You are a seriously irksome creature. I'm sorry, everybody. He was really going... I was so looking forward to putting him under the microscope, but now he won't sit still. And although he looks a little bit like a sort of the demon beetle of Juma, he's completely harmless. See? Until he bites me, of course. He does, H. Macy. You say he looks like a giant stink bug, but he's not a bug. He's definitely a beetle. Uh, there's nothing bug-like about him. And so, although he looks buggish, he's not a bug and he won't make a smell. He's got quite a lot of armor on him. He's got two nice little spikes on the back, which would also be nice to look at under the microscope. But unfortunately, he's just doing his laps at the moment. Up and down the stick he's walking. <laughs> That's it. Come on, get tired. Uh, he sat literally for ten minutes, not moving an inch. Now, he's moving. Lorena, you reckon his legs are massive? Yeah, they are quite big, but it's his, it's his antenna that are the most important part of the longhorn beetle, of course. That's what gives him his name. I'm not sure exactly which longhorn he is. We'll have to look that up. But that's what gives him his name, and if I was to capture him, if I was to grab him by his carapace and hold him up to my microphone, you would almost certainly hear him screaming. They make this high-pitched, plaintive screaming sound. It's dreadful to listen to. But that's only if you capture them, so if they're in distress, you know whether they're in distress. This is very cool. Mary, you're wondering about the hearing abilities of insects. Uh, Mary, I don't know a huge amount about it. M many of them have got rudimentary ears. Some of them don't have ears at all. The grasshoppers and the cicadas, and those sorts of insects, of course, and, and the crickets must be able to hear because that's how they call each other. That's, how that's what that stridulating is for. It's to help them to find mates. So their rudimentary ears will certainly pick up the... Uh, so the vibrations of danger, I suspect, and also, of course, the vibrations of or cr created by their potential mates. Now, something there are some species of moth, for example, that can hear the specific bats that like to eat them. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard try, or tried to hear a bat echolocating. It just sounds like a very high-pitched call from the sort of ether, and many bats will make ultrasonic sounds too high for us to hear, much too high pitched for us to hear. But there are species of moth and species of other insects that are able and have evolved to hear those frequencies so that they don't get eaten. So they can hear the bat trying to echolocate, they'll hear the ping from the bat, it'll go ping, and it travels out, the moth will hear it drop down, sort of, and apparently what they do is, it's quite amazing, they will, if the moth is flying along and it senses the ping of the bat's echolocation, it'll drop quickly. Now, some bats have learned to pick that up and um, they will echolocate the moth. The moth will drop down slightly, faster than they can re-echolocate it, but they predict what the moth is going to do and they'll grab the moth out of the air, having predicted from the ping and the species how to catch it. But the moths, of course, have evolved to drop out of the way of the pinging. So yes, they can hear, absolutely. It's a really cool story, though, isn't it? Alrighty, this chap's not going to move. He's definitely on the move, and so we're going to release him. And while we do that, let us head across to Taylor McCurdy, who is sitting at a dam of crimson colour. <laughs> One thing we do have is this massive cloud that's developing in the distance, and it's actually unusual at this time of the year to see big cumulonimbus clouds forming, because those typically bring rain and thunder and lightning. And I'm not sure if it's rumbling of thunder that I can hear in the distance or a big truck driving somewhere, but it is a little bit eerie. Now, our friend the hippo who you saw with us a while ago is quite a cheeky old man, not even an old man, just a cheeky man in general. As we decided, you know, you know if we think we're going to go and move off, 
I kid you not, we reversed about two meters and he thrashed around in the water like a wriggling worm, almost like uh, um, James's beetle was wriggling around. He was doing a similar thing. Uh, as like I said, they normally get quite playful at this time of the day as the sun comes down. I think he's going to get ready to come out of the water too. So I'm hoping if we sit here for long enough, he is going to thrash about for us. And I have actually have a picture to show you while he has a little nap. Let me show you. I'll bring my camera here. While, what, one that I quickly managed to snap, just to show you how he was thrashing about. Is that all right, David? Just got to make sure we angle it correctly, of course. Look at that. That's what that hippopotamus was doing. How cheeky is he? So we're going to wait for him to do that again, so you can all take your own screenshots. How cool is that? Right place at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's cool. So hippopotamus, I've now told everybody about how great you are and you've got the most beautiful teeth and um, David is some sort of a dentist too and he'd like to examine your mouth so if you wouldn't mind. Oh, that's rude. That's what he thinks of us, David. You see, he just blew bubbles at us. That was the equivalent of a three-year-old child going, nah, 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 nah. Well, that's what pops to mind when he did that. But let's see, if he starts to mouth the water again, we may get lucky. Oh, hang on. He's starting to stand up now. You see how he's pushed his body up? Before he wasn't standing on his feet. He was just sort of resting on the mud below him. But now he's pushed himself up. Let's see what his next move is going to be. He's very relaxed with us being around here. Which is, yes, 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 here we go. He's wriggling his nostrils. Oh, you beautiful hippo. Thank you very much. Look how sharp those teeth are. Yes, there we go, David. Oh, wasn't that worth the wait? You are the best hippo. You beat Henry. You've, out, you've outdone Henry now. What a lovely boy. And as he raises himself out of the water like this, you can see that he's actually not particularly big. Just look at his body size. He, he looks like an African pygmy hippo at the moment because he's quite staunch, but he's not very long. So he's probably only a couple of years old. The hippos can get much longer than this. <laughs> Here he comes again. I, I think he's now behaving like this because I've called him young and small and he's sort of just showing, I'll show you what I can really do and how strong and big I can actually be. But that was what we were waiting for, so I'm so glad that he managed to, to do that. I think you ready for another one, everybody? Smile! Oh, that's beautiful. Now this is typically a threat display when they open their mouths like this, exposing all of their really big teeth. But I don't know if he's quite doing it at us because he doesn't seem to be very agitated by us. Now Clara, you've actually wondered how big can their teeth get. Well, well over 30 centimeters in length, I could imagine, so about the length of a ruler, if not even bigger as the bulls get a bit bigger. Um, so, but I don't know if you saw, if he opens his mouth again, just have a look how his teeth, how sharp those sort of tusks really are. And it's because they're rubbing up against each other, continuously sharpening them. So when hippo bulls fight, like I said, it's a serious matter and, and hippos actually come into conflict quite often. You'll get youngsters uh, that think that they're big and strong enough to come in and take on a raft of hippos and the big bulls often have to sort them out and it doesn't take much. Those teeth will slice through their flesh as sort of like a butter knife goes through butter type of thing. It's, it's not very difficult. Look again, he's going to do it again. So have a look at those bottom teeth. Look how sharp they are. That is like a knife. That would go straight through you, straight through any amount of metal. You really would not. Oh, and his feet. Look at his feet. We never get to see Hippo's feet. That was cool. Well, this is, I've had such a, I've had so much luck over the last few days with the hippos and even Byron. We, we've uh, really had them put on a good show for us. I always find it amazing when you get to see a hippo's foot. And like I said, I love it when they roll around like that. So again, he's getting ready. He's getting active. He's relaxed for most of the day now. He's hungry. And hopefully he's, we're going to see him get up and walk out of the water too because that would be very, very special. Normally they're not too comfortable to leave the dam while you're there. So what it might take from us is actually to move a bit further away. Let's see how he, what he does though. If he starts to inch his way towards the bank, we'll probably move back and just give him a bit of room. We have got this lovely zoom on the camera so we don't need to be too close to him. Now... 
Beverly, you were wondering if some of his teeth were broken off. I didn't think so. He looked like he had them all there. However, there are different shapes and sizes and lengths, of course. Um, some of them are a lot nicer than others. If he were to do it now, we could have a really good look down his throat and see if he still had his tonsils. Um, and that's just, of course, when they do fight, uh, and they fight with their mouths open, if they, uh, they're fighting head on, those teeth will clash. Very much like an elephant's tusks or a warthog's tusks or even an antelope's horns. They can definitely break and chip away at uh, some of their teeth just from that. Uh, eating wouldn't affect their teeth too much other than wearing them down slightly, but they don't bite the grass off with their teeth. They use their hard inner linings that they have on their lips, so they almost pull it off like that, and then they toss the grass back in their mouth, chew down once or twice, and then swallow it. And what's quite nice is we're able to see that because we have been seeing a lot of this regurgitated grass out on the roads in the morning that the, the hippos have left behind them. Whew. This has been absolutely fantastic. Now, we are going to go off for a short break again. Don't go anywhere. This hippo could toss and turn and expose his teeth and give us a big smile. So stay tuned for the next exciting moment. Wonderful. I think we're going to leave our dear friend over here. He's put on a good show for all of us now. But Byron, has uh, he's got himself unstuck again. He's moving around freely and he's arrived at Treehouse Dam. I am indeed. I'm taking time to reflect, Taylor. <laughs> Beautiful reflection on the water at the moment. But, Taylor, we've managed to find those buffalo again that you saw earlier. Apparently it's the same buffalo. Now it looks like there are only two there. Apparently you had three. So I can't see another one here. Maybe it's moved off somewhere. Nice big buffalo bulls. The Dugger Boys. Now Dugger, Dugger Boy, I'm sure some of you have heard the explanation before and I don't know if Taylor mentioned it to you earlier. But the, the word Dugger Boys comes from a Zulu word meaning umdaga, which is mud, and um, and it's because these big male buffalo like to wallow and lie around water holes and mud wallows, just like they are doing now. So that got them the nickname Dugger Boys. Now you can see that bull over there chewing the cud. We were speaking about ruminants earlier, and that's exactly what that male is doing over there. And both of them chewing the cud digesting their food I do like the buffalo bulls I must be honest get to rog you asked do the herbivores have taste buds um, because you say that the vegetation doesn't seem to be too tasty. Well, I'm almost certain they do. I don't know to what extent, but I'm almost certain they do. And the reason I say that is, especially with the herbivores, which are browsers, they will feed on trees. Now, usually what happens is certain trees have got um, protection against the herbivores, like the thorns. So they'll have thorns to protect them from herbivores from over-browsing, so eating too much of them. However, some trees have got high tannin content. So the high tannin content prevents the animals from feeding on them too much because it's distasteful. So that high tannin content must obviously leave a bitter mouth in their t in their uh, bitter taste in their mouth. So that would make me think that they definitely have taste buds. I don't think they are as acute as our taste buds, but I do believe that they do have some form of taste and they are able to tell which plant is good to eat and which is less tasty as the others and which have perhaps high tannin contents and which don't. So get to rog? I do think so. I do think so indeed. It's very peaceful around the water hole at the moment. Now again we have some vehicle issues. <laughs> So maybe you'd like to stay with us for this because this could be quite interesting. Okay, I'm going to jump off quickly because I've <laughs> See, 
see the vehicle won't start, so I've got it. Oh no! No. Which way? Let's try and go forward, maybe. Hold on, we just need a little bit of a hill. <laughs> Are you enjoying this, Seb? Yeah. <laughs> a bit of momentum. Oh, not enough. <sighs> this might take us a little bit longer than expected. I need to get to that hill, so I've got to push a little bit further. So I don't know. <laughs> do you want to see me get it started, or do I want to link to James? Okay, I want to see me get it started, all right. Hold on. Oh, I have to get it going again. <laughs> give me a second, give me a second. And then you start from be behind you. Seb, yes. it's better work. Yes. Oh. Come on. <laughs> we need more of a hill. Uh, you see what they they put us through here? This isn't fair. Okay. Yay! <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Let's go back to James, Mr. Fitness himself. <laughs> I loved that. I thought it was just brilliant. They, Kirsten said, I'm going to link to you now. I said, no, 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 no. Let's, let's let this play out. That was fantastic. It was brilliantly done, actually, to push it from behind like that and then get it going. He's a powerful fellow, is our Byron. We're going to go outside. I found a butterfly which I've seen many times. I think I've misidentified it before. I think what it is, actually, is something called a small orange acria. There they are, Ferg, they're in the same place they were. We rushed back inside because we heard that Byron was behaving like a clown, which indeed he was. A very muscular clown, of course. And here they are. On the edge of this tree here. It's a groovier tree that's growing out of a thicket of the plant that never keeps or never stops giving and what's interesting for me is that not that they call a small orange acria that is quite interesting but that the male is almost completely orange with a little bit of black on the wings but the female is extremely variable she can be all sorts of different colors always various forms of orange and black but sometimes the four wings are almost gray in color like she's getting very old and these two, I think, are a male and a female, and I think that we have... Let me just get around here. Oh, sorry. It's just getting to the time of day when they're going to start to settle. I think this is a female, and I think that's because the forewing is definitely slightly lighter than the hindwing. Now we've got another insect here. Fergusto. I think it's a mayfly of some sort. Good grief, we are having an insect bonanza. Do you see where this grass is? Can you see where I'm... Can you see where I'm pointing? Mm -hmm. There's a little green fly-like creature with clear gossamer wings. Have you got it? Well, you see, it's very well disguised. Let me point again. Can you see it there? Can you see my grass stalk? Mm -hmm. It's just underneath that leaf. Can anyone see it? Kirsten? Not yet. You got it. Good. And not only can I see that, but I can also see another little creature that's definitely my, too microscopic for the camera. We'll try and put it under the microscope. 
but all of these insects of course are now starting to settle for the evening which is of course what we should be doing and what we will be doing fairly soon Oh, <laughs> sorry Bush Mum, you say, are the terms acria and butterfly interchangeable or is an acria a type of butterfly? Bush Mum, it's the latter. An acria is a very vast group of butterflies, a very large group of, uh, I don't know quite how many species, but probably over 50 species of butterfly. And they're all distributed in different parts of the world and, and uh, the country as well. We've got lots of different ones in this country. And, you know, we start off the season saying, oh, well, that's an acria, that's a grasshopper, that's a mayfly, that's a uh, dragonfly. And then by the end of the season, we're trying to identify them down to species level. And that's what we've managed to do with this one. A little orange acria. Very good. Now, this plant that we're on here also contains a grasshopper that I've been unable to identify. And I've looked and looked and I can't find him anywhere, so if anybody would like to help me, hashtag Safari Life, is how you do that. Can you see where I'm pointing, Fergus? Just follow the stick down. Follow the edge of the stick. You got it? Here we go. Mm, can you see? Can you see there? Just in front of the stick. Ant. You're on the ant. <laughs> right? That is polyrachis. There is the grasshopper. You see it? I think your angle is not good enough. Yeah, you, you got him there. This is properly challenging film work that uh, Fergus is being called upon to do here. Because... I've got Polly there. You've got Polly. And you've got Geraldine the grasshopper. I'm not sure why I call this one Geraldine. But this one has got very orange abdomen, very orange back legs, and much longer, much longer antenna than the one we were looking at earlier. Now the one we were looking at earlier I did identify. It is called Pseudotheracles. Pseudotheracles, so not quite a Theracles, a Pseudotheracles, and they're characterized by being almost all green and with very short antenna. So that was well spotted. And that one I cannot find in the book, I'm afraid. I don't know what he is, or she is, or it is. Good. Now, I wonder if I shouldn't try and capture this mayfly and put it under the microscope. It's certainly not cold yet, so it's not like this thing couldn't fly away if it wanted to. But let's hope that all it thinks it's happening is that there is a fairly stiff breeze blowing. Unfortunately, the groovier plant is very good for string. Oh, it's gone. Here it is. Look at it on the end of the grass there. Ah. Oh. What a painful, painful little fly. There, land on me. There, I've got it. I had it. It's gone. Right, it's gone. That's it. Well, let's go back inside. And uh, what did I want to do? Oh yes, see if I could identify that little fly. There you can see the sun is beginning to set on the western horizon. Beautiful. And I'm rather distressed by the lack of big cats on this drive. I must confess to you, it's been a little bit long, I feel, without them. Put that back in there. And... Do we have Rover back yet? Oh, sorry, Fergus. Bye-bye. See ya. Bye. Fergus has a small problem. Um, it's not a psychological one. I think psychologically he's relatively sound, actually. He does work for Wild Earth, so he's definitely not completely sound, uh, but he's quite sound. Um, I will find this fly, I think, when I'm off air, because it's not very fun watching somebody look through a book. But what we do have here is a plant, which I'm going to do a bit of sort of examining 
of off air. Let's go across to Byron. I think that he is doing something known as driving. <laughs> I am this time, James. Thank goodness the vehicle started as you saw. <laughs> Caught my breath again. Um, now, again, I haven't seen too much. But I, maybe, you know what, it's starting to cool down quite a bit now. Maybe, maybe we are going to have some activity from animals moving around as this cool temperature creeps in on us. I'm going to head towards some clearings, going to have a look around there. Haven't had too much luck around the water holes. It was nice to see those buffalo though. Always great seeing buffalo. But hardly any impala. Um, not too many other antelope. I keep scanning the trees, just hoping that we find a kill hoisted high up in one of these marula trees perhaps. We Scotland, you asked if you if we see any is it injured animals on drive? Can we stop and help them? Was that the question, Kirst? Sick animals, sick animals. Well, we Scotland no, it depends on the on the animal, it depends how it got injured. Um but generally we do not interfere at all. So we don't if the, sick or injured animals it's nature's, it, we allow nature take, to take its course. And you need to remember, we are purely here to, to view the animals and, and observe them. We're not here to interfere. We, even though technically we've interfered already just by being here, but, but in terms of the natural selection of wildlife, we've got to let nature take its course. So, um, so no, we don't interfere at all. If, however, an animal is injured due to human intervention, so if, for example, now we don't have this in this area, but in other areas, if, for example, you had, we found an animal that had a snare around it or something that somebody had set up, then yes, we would interfere, we would get a vet in, dart the animal, cut the snare, clean the wound, and let it go again, because that animal has been injured due to people. Um, however, if it's natural cause, animals injuring each other, or getting sick from natural causes, that's just nature's way of survival of the fittest, and we're not made to interfere with that at all. And it is sometimes difficult, and some people don't agree with it, but this is a natural environment, and, um, and we need to remember that. This whole entire um, Greater Kruger National Park, the animals are free, they move around, there's no intervention. The only bit of intervention, technically, are the water holes that we provide in parts of all well, the entire Greater Kruger. And that's because the animals don't move away as far as they used to hundreds of years ago, where they would possibly migrate towards the mountain range, the Drakensberg mountain range, where they would get water in the winter. So now, because they stay in these areas, we just make sure there are water, but also areas do that for game viewing to hopefully have the animals around. But in terms of interfering with the animals and that, that doesn't happen. It is a, it's, it's a natural um, ecosystem, so we can't interfere. All right, Seb, let's try to find a leopard somewhere. Maybe, maybe a beautiful female walking around. That would be nice. Haven't seen a female for quite some time. We're still searching for some more animals. Uh, I think we're going to head to Arethusa Airstrip now. And hopefully we're going to catch the sunset. We might actually have to go a little bit quicker. Hey, David. I think I'm a bit, a bit of a tortoise this afternoon and bumbling along on the slow side, but we'll change that. No, 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 we've done enough fast driving for one day. The, the amount, or the, the rate at which I was speeding around this morning, I think I'm good for the next month. But we won't be doing that. We'll just be doing a casual Monday afternoon sunset safari. And maybe we'll find our favorite family of warthogs, one of them that lives at uh, the Arethusa airstrip. Perhaps the jackals will make an appearance tonight. We'll definitely uh, go scanning around from them. Uh, we're not too far away. It might take us about, I'd say about 10 minutes to get there. 
if we, we're sort of going to head straight towards there, we're not going to do any detours unless we find something fantastic. But I've also been listening on the Game Drive radio, the bits and pieces that I've managed to hear. Unfortunately, there haven't been any elephant sightings, and there's no big cat sightings that anyone has found just yet. But that could have also could, could of course, my goodness, I must be a little bit on the dehydrated side. Um, it feels like my tongue keeps getting stuck up against my the, the roof of my palate. Not great. Um, so I think we could have some luck of uh, big cats starting to get active now and moving around. The temperature is most certainly cooling down. And it's going to be time to put our jackets on. Hey, David, soon. Not me, though, because I forgot to bring one this afternoon, which was silly. I'm going to learn my lesson today on why you must always remember to take a jacket on safari, no matter how hot it is. You just don't know uh, what the weather is going to do. And it's getting cold now. It's getting very, very cold. There's a nice open clearing just over here. Let's see if we've got a big hood of impala. No? Empty. <laughs> I was hoping we were going to come across some planes game. There aren't any. Just some clouds and some trees. Not even any birds chirping just yet. Let's see what else we can find. Hmm. Beautiful leadwoods. Well, they're not leadwoods, so they once were knob thorns. Lots of knob thorns around here. Oh, hang on. That's actually very pretty. Let me go. Like that? There we go, David is, we're just going to turn the camera, of course, don't worry about turning your heads, David will fix that. I always do that whenever I watch the show and, and we haven't quite leveled out yet, I turn my head so that I can see the white right way up. I don't know if anybody else does that, but that would make for a great wallpaper, I think, with the dead tree, the dead knob thorn, a couple of bush willows peering into frame, and then, of course, all those lovely clouds. Look at that lovely golden light just above it. And of course, I don't know if we're going to make it to the airstrip to do the sunset, so we might have to just do it here, because that thick wall of clouds that the sun is disappearing behind is actually quite high. Normally we'd have another 20 minutes, at least, of sunlight, but I think we're going to be bringing out the spotlights a little bit earlier. Oh, Byron's playing a game of copycat this afternoon. We've got our sunset here on Arethusa. Let's go and see what it looks like from Duma. We've got a beautiful sunset and look at those clouds in front of the sun at the moment. That is really very beautiful and a bit of an artistic shot there with the tree in the foreground. Beautiful marula tree. Look at that. It's really lovely. Can you hear some green wood hoopoos? They might even, I thought they'd fly into the marula, but they haven't, just in the distance. Isn't that great? Look at those clouds moving in front of the, the sun. Oops. I'm almost on those clearings. I'm going to have a look around there and see if we've got some animals. Oh, oh dear. Oh. Oh dear. It's giving up on us. Let's go to Taylor who's got a hornbill. <laughs> From having not too many animals this afternoon to all of a sudden them jumping in front of the cars, we've got a beautiful yellow-billed hornbill who's very grumpy. But it won't be very grumpy after it works out how to eat this giant click beetle. Now I think the click beetle, I don't know if it's dead yet or if it's just pretending to be dead because a lot of insects out here do perform thanatosis where they completely freeze themselves up and hope that whatever is trying to nibble on them will lose interest. And you can see this hornbill struggling. It hasn't quite worked out how it's going to get the fleshy parts of this click beetle. They've got a very hard carapace on their back. 
and it's most certainly difficult to get through. Now, crunch down on it. I would go with the crunching technique and then pulling bits of the shell off, but of course that's because I've got fingers and I think it would be easier. What are you doing now? Given up? Did it? F no, it didn't. It's just given up, hasn't it? Well, that wasn't a very good attempt at trying to get the beetle out. Beetle, now's your chance. Make your escape. Wake up. We won't tell. We'll distract the hornbill. It's not waking up. I'll keep watching it, though. The hornbill has now found something else to eat. I wonder if it's not pecking at ants or termites. You can see that it's nibbling on something else. It's a lot easier. I think it is termites that it has found. You're, you're not worth, um, you're not putting in all of that effort, are you? With trying to get that beetle. Now, that would be a very nutritious meal. But I suppose wasting so much time on trying to oh, get through that carapace is quite difficult and it just shows you that even a beetle is quite well protected and sometimes if it hasn't got a bit of brain damage now because being th sort of thrashed around like that and crunched on I can't imagine would be too ha healthy for that little beetle so I hope that it does have an opportunity to get through my goodness right we're going to go across to Brent now in the Mara and I'm sure he's going to show you the beautiful lions Look at this guys, we've made our way back to the Angama Pride where we started this morning and there are two females there and they're wondering where on earth they left their little cubs. Now those four are gorgeous bundles of joy we saw a little bit earlier. There are seven in total in the Angama Pride and uh, the little ones are right here next to us and I think one of them has spotted mom. I can't hear if they're calling yet. But it is, I'm pretty sure they will find them. We don't have much time, unfortunately, uh, before we have to start making our way back up to the top of the mountain. But just to give you an idea, you, you can see those four little gorgeous cubs. There's another three with, um, I think, one of the other females in the grass, long grass behind them. But just to give you an idea of the incredible... Oh, yes. Off it go. Off they go. I've seen mom. Oh, they've heard mom calling. Off they go. Bundling. We've got, we've got to climb up the mountain to get... To get um... Oh, look there, mom. Look at the... Oh, and there's another one calling... Behind us. Oh, there's another lioness. It's so deeply frustrating, isn't it? Wonderful to see those things there, especially with the wonderful view. Elephants seem to be ubiquitous all over the place. Magnificent sightings of the uh, Olu Lolo escarpment in the background. Say that, everybody, together. Olu Lolo. Escarpment, yes, absolutely. Cousin, do we have a school joining us? Two schools. They're about to join us in two minutes, everybody. <laughs> You're going to have to remind me of their names. You're going to have to remind me of their names, the school's names. I can look on my telephone, but we're not allowed to be on the phone while we're on. I got Torbert F. T. Bomb and James F. Sutherland. So Charles F. Tigard and James S. Sutherland. F for Fox. As long as it's for Fox. James F. Sutherland, Charles Tigard. I'm just going to leave out the middle names, I think. Charles Tigard and um, James Sutherland. Good. And we'll begin, of course, with these school kids and a rather interesting creature, which I can't yet to identify. Ronald the Rover is not functioning. I've got it stuck in a hole. Byron is not functioning. His life is stuck in a hole. Ha 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 ha. Uh, Taylor is trying to find... Oh, come on, James. There we go. This 
I believe everyone, mm, is an ant that has been caught in a spider's web. And I'm sorry for the focus issue, it's not very good. No, sorry, let me just move it away quickly. Oh. Now it's shaking all over the place, there we go. Is that alright? It's not great. Curzon, come back to me, let me try and put it on stand, I think. I think this is an ant caught in a, in a spider's web, and I wonder if the spider isn't on this grass called Pogonathra squirosa. Ah, this is going to be much better now that I can let go of the thing. Let go, Henry. Let go. Let go, my boy. Let go. Do not hold on forever. Ah. Now, no one breathe, please. Now, is that the spider, or is it an ant that's been caught there? I can't tell. Fergus, don't even breathe. Don't even think about breathing. Let's just watch it for a while and see if it doesn't unwrap itself. I, you know, we were talking about those animals that display... Um, or they pretend to be dead, and I can never remember the name. I can never remember that word. You know, Taylor had just said it. Uh, anyway, I wonder if the spider isn't doing exactly the same thing. All right, we're going to go back to Taylor. I they, they simply don't trust me enough to remember the school's names, so we're going to head across to Taylor, because she can. <laughs> Welcome, welcome to Charles F. Tigard and James F. Sullivan. We're so happy to have you here this afternoon. The two schools that are joining us on this fine summer's day. You just saw the beautiful skyline. You've just missed the sunset. It disappeared only a couple of minutes ago. Now, my name is Taylor and on camera with me today is David. James is in the tent. Byron is also out driving around and we're hopefully going to find you a whole lot of animals this afternoon. So remember, you can ask any questions that you like. You can just ask them uh, to your teacher and then then Kirsten will read them into my ear and then I shall answer them for you. But now we need to find, of course, one of the most important things out here is an animal. Even a nice big bird this afternoon could be quite nice. Putting things back. Now, just a moment ago, David and I were attaching a very big light. You can't see it, but it's just above the camera and it's an infrared camera. So it means if we find some of the animals that we normally can't look at at night, we just flip the switch, everything goes green, and then we're able to see these animals without bothering them. But I found our first target this afternoon, and it's two birds just down on the road. You can just start to see them. <gasps> and it looks like the one on the right has actually got something in its mouth. Don't fly away. Good birdie, stay there. Those are yellow-billed hornbills. Now I can't see what it's got in its mouth. It actually looks like it's holding a piece of grass in its mouth. I think you're a little bit confused, yellow-billed hornbill. You don't eat grass. You like to eat insects. That is your favorite thing to eat. I think it was a bit embarrassed that I said, well, I maybe embarrassed him. So sorry, hornbill. But those are two of my favorite birds, and they are so funny. They've got those big, long beaks. They almost look like they're toucans, but they're not toucans. I'll say the name again for you. Southern yellow-billed hornbill. And uh, they're very funny to watch. We actually just saw one a moment ago and it was trying to attack a massive beetle but it didn't get into uh, the beetle. The shell was a bit too hard for it. Let's see what else we can find. We've got to keep our eyes open when you are on safari. You've got to look from left to right or from right to left. And well, Byron has now beaten us to finding a mammal first. Let's go and take a look at some impala. Hello everyone and to all the children that just joined us. My name is Byron and on camera with me is Seb. Now we've just found a little herd of impala that I'd love to show you. Let's have a look. They're just around this bush behind the tree. Here we go. There they are. Now these impala are all enjoying this clearing at the moment they um 
and the reason why they're all out in the clearing is because it's nice and safe they can keep a lookout for any predators and they can keep each other safe by warning each other if they do see any predators so it's ideal for them especially at night they'll come out they'll spend the evening on these clearings on this open area so that they can be safe and warn each other if there's any potential danger Sophia, we find animals both night and day. Different animals might be active at night um, compared to some of the animals during the day that we see. However, a lot of these antelope, for example, so the impala, the kudu, all those animals will always be around at night um, because we need to remember. Now, Sophia, this is quite interesting, but these animals don't sleep like we do because out here, if you sleep or you lose concentration you can become potential food for predators so they'll rest and they'll lie down but they don't actually sleep they're always awake they're always aware of what's going on around them so isn't that fascinating think about that that you never sleep these animals can't like I said because if they do sleep or they do lose concentration they will potentially become food for predators so in terms of what we see at night or during the day all the animals are around but at night time we might see more activity from some of the predators like lions and leopards they generally prefer moving around more at night uh, Joshua um, now you asked have the impala evolved from llamas no Joshua I think maybe because of the name um, sounding similar you've asked if they evolved from llamas no they haven't this is a species of antelope a llama is a completely different animal um, so the impala have been around for many many years they've just uh, I wonder what they evolved from but a species of of herbivore which moved around this area but they are just one of the many antelope species that we get here now some of you might be looking at them thinking they look like deer. Now there's a difference. We do not have deer in Africa like you do back home. You've got a lot of deer. We don't. So we only have antelope species. Now the easiest way to tell the difference is that the antelope have horns which grow throughout their lifetime. So we call them horns. Whereas the deer have antlers. Now you might have seen some of these deer with these big antlers. But the difference is the antlers are shed every year. Which means they lose those antlers. They fall off. But each year they grow new antlers back. Now that doesn't happen with antelope. The antelope horns grow throughout their lifetime. And with the deer they lose them every year but they grow back again. So that's the main difference. Now we don't have any species of deer in Africa, as I said. We only have different types of gazelle and antelope. Now with these impala, only the males have horns. See, you can see that male very clearly with a big set of horns. But the females, they do not have horns. So you can tell the difference very easily purely by looking at the horns. There's some females over there. You can see they don't have any horns. Do you see that? There's a little bird sitting on the back of that one called an oxpecker. So there was a little bird on the back called an oxpecker. And they pick off little ticks and fleas on the oxpeckers, uh, on the <laughs> impala. They look for little ticks and they sit on the impala and feed on them. very very peaceful at the moment and I think we we're approaching full moon it's not quite full moon just yet but it's very bright out here Donovan now you asked a, a question about the the impala and them and sleeping um, and I was explaining a bit earlier about how 
dangerous it can be to lose concentration out here. So Donovan and the Impala don't actually sleep. They will always stay awake and always remain alert and aware if there are any potential predators. So they don't sleep. They'll rest and they'll lie down and rest, but they'll always stay awake. They'll always be on the lookout for any potential predators. So they cannot sleep out here. Most of the animals don't sleep, not like we do. Um, you might get lions and leopards and elephants resting and sleeping slightly, but they're still completely aware and alert of what's going on around them. There's a view of that beautiful moon. Now I wonder if my friend James in the tent has got a view of the moon. I do not have a view of the moon. I cannot see the moon anywhere. Hello kids, my name is James. Yes, it is. And you can ask me any questions you like. We're going to be looking at some small things in the tent, mainly because we have this very special thing here called a microscope. And the first thing we're going to show you under the microscope is a spider. Now this spider, unfortunately, is not moving very much. It is very much alive, but it's not moving because, of course, we are now pretty much into the night time and it's obviously a diurnal spider that doesn't move around in the night and so it's just a little bit cold and so it's sort of curled up a little bit like I suppose a cat or a dog might do when it's really cold and it'll be waiting for things to come along probably ants to climb up and down this grass stalk that it's living on and that they will do tomorrow morning. Now I was listening to Byron talking to you just now and he was talking about the Impala and how old they are and that very clever question came from Josh about whether they had evolved from llamas or not. Uh, they haven't. But do you know how old Impalas are? Impalas have been in their current form for five million years. Isn't that amazing? Five million years. And very few other animals in the world that have been around for that long. Of course, the crocodile would be a notable exception. Look how tiny the spider is. You see it there? I think that's wonderful. Now, Jesse, this is a difficult question to answer, and you might think it's easy, but it isn't. You say, what is the rarest animal that we get here? Remember, this spider is an animal. I don't know how many kind, many of these spiders there are around here. I don't even know what kind of spider this is. It's almost impossible to identify. So there could be some very, very rare insects, some very rare spiders, some ticks, perhaps even a rare fish or two that we just don't know about. But I think you probably mean mammals. And the rarest mammal that we'd find here is something called a wild dog. And a wild dog is like the wolf of Africa. It looks like a sort of painted dog, about the size of a German shepherd or Alsatian. A little bit taller maybe, slightly slighter, not quite as muscly, with huge ears that look like two dinner plates that have been attached to the front of its head. And they are my favorite animal out here. And they're black and brown and uh, white, and they look like like sort of they've been painted in camouflage. Anyway, maybe we'll see some of them. I'm not sure it's getting dark now, but one of the animals that's about to come out of where it rests is the thing that Taylor is sitting with now. We are indeed. We've <coughs> just arrived at a dam called Twin Dams, and to our surprise, there are two hippopotamus waiting in the water. So I hope you're excited because, don't be scared when I say this, but this is the most dangerous animal in Africa. So we've got to be very, very careful around them. But I am safe. David and I are both safe here. We are sitting in the cars and we're sitting very high up on the dam wall. So as long as we don't want to go swimming with the hippos, we should be okay. And David, you don't have a canoe with you, do you? No. So we're not going to go canoeing with the hippos either. So that means that we will be fine. <clears throat> Nick, I know Nicholas, I don't know if your full name is Nicholas, but I'm going to call you Nicholas now. Uh, you're wondering how we protect ourselves. So the most important thing that you must remember with the animals, Archer, is that they don't just want to hurt you. If they feel threatened, if they feel scared, they will let you know. So they have warning signs. And one of the warning signs, particularly of a hippopotamus, is that, that they will open their mouths really, really wide and expose all of their teeth. And by doing that, that is a threat display. That's supposed to make me go, oh, 
I don't want to be eaten by a hippopotamus, but also they've got very, very big bodies so that they can charge and run over you. So you do have to be careful. But when a hippo shows you that you're unhappy with, well, they're unhappy with us, then we have to react to the situation. We decide, okay, are we in a safe spot? What could be causing this hippo to be upset? Is it us? Or is it something around them? Maybe there's a herd of buffalo coming to drink. Maybe there's a lion just sitting at the edge of the water watching them. And then we sort of decide what we will do from there. But at the moment, the hippos are very much relaxed, but they've disappeared under the water. So just by being in the car, of course, we are, are relatively safe. But again, you just got to be careful. And we can outrun the animals in the car, not on foot, though. You'll be very lucky if you manage to outrun a hippo on foot. And that's the one thing that you should never do when you come out on safari is run away from the animals. Now, Jonathan, you're wondering why is the hippo the most dangerous animal? So hippos kill more people in Africa than the big five put together. So the big five is lions, leopards, elephants, rhinos, and buffaloes. And the reason why they are so dangerous is because there's unfortunately still a lot of poverty in South Africa. So there's not even just in South Africa, but in the whole of Africa. So as you move away from South Africa and you go into, let's talk about Zambia because I've worked there. Oh, look, it's opening its mouth. No, not quite showing you its big teeth just yet. Maybe it will do it again. But people will still go down to dams and rivers to wash their clothes, to wash their pots and pans, and even to bath. And they'll normally do so first thing in the morning to get all their chores done and that's when the hippos are coming back to the water so at this time of the day they should start to leave the dam to go and graze so they just eat grass and they can travel long distances but they come and spend their days in the water so that's the biggest problem is you're standing there washing your pots and pans or perhaps you're collecting water and a hippo comes down and says hey I'd actually like to go back to the water and if you come in between a hippo and water that's when you can get yourself in a lot of trouble also if you go on canoeing safaris or even on a boat safari in a river that has got lots and lots of hippos you've got to be very careful of the big bulls because they are very territorial, so they're very protective over the females, over the girls. Hello. Come on, open your mouth. Let's see if it's going to do it. Wants to do it, wants to open its mouth. Now this doesn't, I don't know if this is a, a male, this might be a youngster. Though the two of them actually look like females to me. Now Colin, you're wondering how big does a hippo get? They're quite large. While they're in the water, they don't look very big at all. But when they do come out on land, the boys are much larger than the girls. And if I had to give you a reference of size, I would say like a very small car, maybe a little beetle of some sort. They, don't, they probably weigh about the same. And they're very long too. But it's very difficult to describe to you how big they are. They might be even almost the a male will be almost the length of the car that we're in at the moment. Maybe three quarters of this length, and we're in a, and we're not in a particularly big car either. But maybe if we're very very lucky and we sit here, we'll get to see them leaving the water, and then you'll be able to see for yourselves how big a hippo actually is. But that's a very very lucky sight to see. A hippo out on land. Like I said, they don't feel very comfortable. So normally when they feel spotted, they run away. Now, Karen, you're wondering how heavy is a hippo? Hippos can weigh quite a bit. The females, like I said, are much smaller. So the females normally weigh up to about one and a half tons, between one and one and a half tons. And the bulls can get much larger than that. They can get to almost two tons, so 2,000 kilograms. I'd say a little bit less than that, but I have definitely seen some very, very big hippos in my life. And especially down, not down, up in, in Zambia. Uh, I saw lots and lots there. Very big bulls coming out in the night and grazing right in front of the lodge. Now, Rick, wow, you're wondering who would run faster, a hippo? Oh, Nick, Nick, sorry, Nick. Um, you were wondering who could run faster, a hippo or a black bear? I've never seen a black bear before. But I reckon that a hippo would give a black bear a run for its money. They can reach speeds of about 35 kilometers an hour out on land. So even though they're quite large, they're quite fat, and they've got the shortest little legs you have ever seen, but they can move those short little stubby legs very, very quickly. I can promise you right now, even Usain Bolt, who is the sprinting champion. Oh, wow. 
wouldn't be able to outrun a hippo or maybe he'd be able to outrun a hippo for about 10 seconds and then that's about it and then the hippos would catch you but how cool is that hippos putting on a show for you this evening splashing around the water but now talking about creatures of the night byron has found the first one i have indeed everyone look at that a beautiful flap neck chameleon can you believe that now that is not something we see every day and it's difficult to spot them as you can imagine because the chameleons blend in so well now have a look at how far he is and we just managed to spot him look at that can you believe that <laughs> that's wonderful so nice to show you something that we can spot in the evening a little flap neck chameleon and they've got a very prominent flap on the back of the neck that's why their name but have a look at that beautiful tail you see how that tail is curled up too now they can use that as an additional limb to hold on hold on to the branches and uh, if they are moving around but then also if you look closely look at those eyes you'll see the eyes moving around a little bit now the interesting thing with the chameleon there you see the eye it's moving all around now the interesting thing with the chameleon is it can move its eyes individually so that means that one eye can look forward and one eye can look backwards. Now you try to do that. It's almost impossible. No, it is impossible. It's not almost impossible. So, but isn't that amazing? And they can have a full view of what is around them all the time. Now these little chameleons are mainly active during the day. They move around during the day and at night they try and hide up in the trees. And they'll stay very, very still to avoid predators like birds or snakes. And they sit on the tips of the branches and hide there. But this one was unable to hide from us. We managed to spot it. And I'm so glad you got to see one with us. That's something really, really nice and something we get to see at night. <laughs> Nursely, you asked, how can we see them? Now, it does take a lot of practice. And um, I've been doing this for a very long time. And I worked with a friend of mine who's a tracker. And he, him and I worked together for five years. And he was very, very good at spotting animals at night with the spotlight. And he taught me how to look for chameleons. So the shape is a little bit different to the leaves. They do stand out slightly. But again, you need to know what to look for. And it takes a lot of practice. Um, still, I'm not as good as it, at it as he was. He was very, very good at it. But um, but I'm getting better. I'm getting better. It's nice to see them. We'll see if we can find some others. Now, now Nick, you've asked a question Sorry, that a lot of people have asked me before. How many colors can the chameleon change? So not that many, Nick. Usually the chameleons change that green color. And uh, this is the only chameleon species we get in this area but they'll turn a green color and then they also turn a grayish color at some time some times of the year to blend into dead trees and then also they will turn a slightly blackish color on their on their back if they feel threatened if they are in any danger they'll make the color black on the back i'm going to see if we can get going now again Uh, now, James has got something under the microscope to show you. Let's see what he's found this time. I do have something under the microscope, everybody. And I just wanted to quickly tell you that I've seen a chameleon like that very unusually, but I've seen it around about this color. And they sometimes do that sort of color in the wintertime when the vegetation, of course, goes the sort of golden brown. So sometimes they can go that color, but normally they are that orange color. Now, something else that is, well, that green color, something else very colorful is what I have here. Look at this. It is a flower called the Cape Honeysuckle. And look what's living in it. There are a whole lot of ants and they're going in and they're collecting the nectar that's inside this beautiful plant. And the little plant, tiny as it is, is a whole world 
on its own. Isn't it amazing? Doesn't that make you want to climb inside there? It looks like such fun to go sliding down into the middle of the plant, drink some sweet juice and come out again and sort of just enjoy being surrounded by such a happy colour that is the orange and yellow here. Of course, you'd have to share it with the ants, which may be not so nice, but I just think it's fantastic. See, in they go, knocking about, looking what they can find, and I'm going to have to put them back on the plant that I found them on, because of course they will get lost otherwise. I think that's just beautiful, and I'll just quickly show you what it looks like. There you go. Now, Kaylee, I'm going to teach you two things now. You say, how many types of spiders are poisonous? One of the ants has fallen off. Get on there. Uh, here it is. It's a beautiful plant called the Cape Honeysuckle, or Tecameria capensis. Haley or Kaylee, is it Kaylee or Haley? Kaylee, you say, how many species of spider are poisonous in Africa? Remember that none of them are poisonous. They are all edible. So if something is poisonous, it means that you cannot eat it. You can eat any of the spiders in South Africa. What you mean, I think, is how many spider species are venomous. In other words, how many of them can bite you and put venom inside you that will cause an envenomation, which of course will then be will cause an effect of some kind. So it'll either be very painful or it will make your neurological system shut down so you have trouble, difficulty breathing, your heart will start to beat very fast, or it will cause the flesh where it's bitten to start to rot and then fall out and create a big sore. Now luckily, Kaylee, there are only four spiders in South Africa that are a problem. One is called a crab spider. There's a couple of crab spiders that are a bit difficult and they will cause a wound like the one I've described to you. Another is called a violin spider which will cause that sort of effect and a little bit of a neurological effect so you'll have trouble breathing. Then there's the brown widow spider and you know about widow spiders and then there is a black widow spider. And you know what? I have a black widow spider and I'll show it to you. The black widow spider, if you wait here Fergus, I'll just quickly bring it inside. The black widow spider is a nasty spider because it is the most venomous spider in Africa and we have one right here in this black box. And what we know about this spider of course is that even though it is very venomous it is not able to kill human beings. It's not possible for it to kill a human being. Well, if you were sick or very young, but if you're a relatively healthy adult, it wouldn't be able to kill you. Now, what you don't want to do is open this box in the wrong place and put your hand... There it is. That's it there. Now, I know this box isn't very pretty. Now, Nick, you've asked a question about... Oh, I've forgotten your question. Sorry, let's get it again. Oh, are spiders nocturnal? Some spiders are nocturnal. Yes, absolutely. I think my favorite spider is something called a bark spider, and they are absolutely nocturnal. And that is a black widow. That is the most venomous spider in all of Africa. And what I will try and do, once Fergus has shown it to you there, is I'm going to try and show it to you under the microscope. But I'm going to be very, very careful about where I put my hands. So this is quite exciting, isn't it? Now, it's not very fast moving, so if it does sort of start running towards me, I can fling this uh, thing out of the window. And Carlin, you're wondering what the biggest spider in Africa is. Well, Carlin, I think it's something called a rain spider, which is about the same size as an adult man's hand. So about the same size as my hand. Let me just turn this round, sorry, we want an upright picture. Right, there we go, there you go. Now what I was hoping the spider would do is rear up and what it does then of course is show that the very distinctive red hourglass shape. Now you get brown and black button spiders there in the United States and you need to be careful of them and the way you identify them is well you can sort of see what this one looks like but it's difficult to imagine what it looks like when it's sort of straight. What you need to look out for 
underneath the belly is a red hourglass shape. And I just want to see if there. Did you see that red? You saw that red there, everybody. That is very diagnostic of a widow spider. So if you see that kind of red color on a black spider, you want to stay away from that. Okay, great stuff. Taylor has found another um, animal of the night and she's looking at it in infrared. We are looking in at an infrared. Remember I said to you that we have this really cool light that turns the picture green? So we're not putting any light at all on this scrub hair. So it's not a rabbit. It is got very big ears as you can see they're long and tall they don't flop like a rabbit's ears often can and you can see that it is listening very very carefully and it's important for the animals out here to have a good sense of hearing that's the way that they spot potential threats that could be coming towards them and out here on a night like tonight you'd find that a, an owl would find this hair a tasty treat a snake might find it delicious to eat that rhymed unintentionally. <laughs> Sometimes I do these things. And then, of course, a hyena or many different animals, or even a young leopard or a young lion learning to hunt would go after a scrub hare. But they are able to defend themselves because a hare, unlike a rabbit, can run really, really, really quickly. So rabbits tend to hop. You can see those very powerful front legs. They've also got very powerful back legs that they'll use to power themselves along the ground. Big claws as well. To help them grip the floor and then they will go darting off into the distance now it's not very bothered by us at the moment and that's because we're sitting in darkness and the reason why it's important not to put a spotlight on an animal that uh, is not used to the light and sometimes the hairs unfortunately get a bit spooked and a bit dazed by the light so the reason for that is of course it causes temporary blindness or disorientation or not blindness is a bad word to choose but disorientation so if you've ever t taken a flashlight and accidentally shined it into your eyes you know what it's like you're completely dazed you see white stars and it takes a couple of seconds before your eyesight gets back to normal and those seconds are vital for the animals out here because that could mean the difference between life and death. And that's what it is. They have to be very, very careful. Now, Ava, you're wondering how big are a rabbit's ears? I'm not sure. Out here, we don't see any rabbits. We do have, uh, in South Africa, we've got the Smith's Red Rock Rabbit and the Riverine Rabbit are the two species that we see. They're quite rare, though, and I haven't seen them up here. So their ears are quite big, but I think a hare's ears could get even longer. Look how big and robust those ears are. But I'm not 100% sure. But he's looking for something to eat now. And he's nibbling on some leaves. It actually looks like he's eating some guari leaves, which is one of my favorite trees out here. They will also eat grass. Chris, please may I have that question again? I didn't hear the last part. Ah, there we go. I'd missed that one. So, Donovan, you're wondering if the scrub hares eat meat. No, they don't. Luckily for me, otherwise I'd be a little bit scared sitting here with the scrub hare, wondering if it would come over and nibble on my leg. But we don't have to worry about that. It just eats vegetation. So it's really just eating grass at the moment. And the grass is still lovely and nutritious because we've had lots of rain, so it's nice and green. And it's providing lots and lots of nutrients and minerals for the scrub hare. But do you see how careful it's being and trying to be as quiet quiet as possible. The animals out here don't want to be spotted. <laughs> Alan, you're wondering who's faster, a kangaroo or a hare? Hmm, if I ever see them in a race one day, I'll let you know, but I think I would put my money on a kangaroo. David, who would you put your money on? Kangaroo as well. I'm not sure at the speed of a kangaroo uh, can hop at. Maybe James can pop it on the interweb and, and find out how fast they can run. I'm also not sure how fast a hare can run, but I have seen them dart off open plains trying to avoid owls before and being chased by jackals. And it's very impressive as to how fun, uh, fast they could go. But I think a kangaroo would have more stamina. I think they'd have a little bit more energy that would allow them to keep going for longer. I think a scrub hare or even a rabbit would get a little bit tired. And this is really, really nice just sitting in the darkness and not disturbing this animal at all and watching it go about its evening. Isn't it quite cool?
Now they're actually quite big, these scrub hairs. They're not very small. And I, I would say that they must be about the size of a soccer ball, not including their ears, of course. So they're, they're quite large. And the rabbits are a little bit smaller. And I think the scrub hairs could be a bit taller too. But how cool is that? Amazing. Now we're going to bring out the spotlight soon. And I have a request before we go across to Byron. Is that I think when you go to him, you should ask him to show you the moon. All right, well, we're still using the spotlights at the moment. I'm trying to look for some owls. That's what I'm looking for at the moment. So I'm having a look in the trees, having a little look around. We might be lucky and find a little owl. We do get lots of different owls around here. So let's see, let's see. We've been very lucky with that chameleon already. Oh, now Nick, you've asked a snake question. You want to know what is the worst snake in Africa? Well, I think, Nick, the one that is probably the f probably feared the most by everybody in Africa is a snake called the black mamba. Now, some of you might have heard of that before. It's a very fast-moving snake, very big snake. They can get up to four meters long, but quite a big snake. They Believe it or not, even though the name says black mamba, they're actually grey in colour, like a light grey colour, but they've got a very pitch black mouth. The inside of their mouth is pitch black. Oh, there's a little scrub head just next to us. I know Taylor showed you one of these already. I'm not going to shine the light on it for too long. Look at that. There he is. Beautiful scrub head. We'll leave him alone for the night. Um, so Nick, the, the black mamba, it's very fast and it is very venomous. Now I know, I think James was just explaining the difference between venom and poison. Now the black mamba is very venomous and it can kill you. It can kill you if it, uh, if it bites you. So you've got to be very careful. But I think that is the scariest snake in Africa, the black mamba. Now there is a beautiful moon tonight and my friend James would like to show you it. Everybody, it's nearly full moon and while you contemplate the moon and what shape you think you can see in there, I will tell you that a kangaroo can run at 70 kilometers per hour, that is 46 miles per hour. Usain Bolt, when he's running, well he's on a slow day and he's running the 100 meters in 10 seconds, we know he can run it a little bit faster than that, but not much, he's running then at 22 miles per hour. So. A, uh, well, no, slightly faster than that, about 28 miles an hour. So, a kangaroo is much faster than Usain Bolt, and I suspect a scrub hare is probably about the same speed as Usain Bolt, maybe even faster than that. Good. Okay, so that's the moon. It's nearly full, probably about a day or two till it's full. The next time you go to Taylor, ask her to show you Jupiter and see if she can find you its moons, because you can see the moons of Jupiter. Now, I had something inside here I think that I wanted to show you. Or have I... F I may have lost it. It may have gone away. No, it has gone away. What I wanted to show you was an insect that was climbing on this piece of grass here, but I'm afraid it seems to have disappeared. Sorry about that. Oh, Kaylee, you want to know if we have tarantulas in Africa? We do. The tarantulas, Kaylee, uh, are called baboon spiders over here. And so, yes, we do get tarantulas over here, and they're called baboon spiders, and they live in the underground. And there are quite a few of them that we find here. Lots of different species, and the most gorgeous one, of course, is the golden baboon spider. And what I'll quickly show you, because I have, I've showed our other viewers this today, but I haven't showed you, is a special kind of insect. <laughs> and it's my new favorite insect, because I've just discovered what it is. Thanks to our viewers. It's called a thrip. Can you see that? That's called a thrip, everybody. And it's living inside a flower called the knotweed. Not knobweed. Not knobweed. Knobweed, yes. Knobweed. And that's called a thrip. 
What kind of a thrip it is, I don't know. There are lots of different kinds of thrips. 263 species, I'm told, in this area. 4,500 in the world. So you'll no doubt have lots of thrips where you happen to be. And thrips are much slower than Usain Bolt. They're much slower than... Uh, kangaroos, they're much slower even than I am running, and I know all of you are very fast runners, uh, so they're definitely slower than you are. Isn't that pretty? Noah, you want to know what time it is in Africa? Well, it, there's no way to answer that question because, of course, Africa is so big. Africa is much bigger than the United States. And so we have lots of different times. Just like you in the United States, we've got Eastern Standard Time, uh, Pacific Time. You've got Mountain Time. I think you've even got some sort of Central Time. So you cover about four time zones. Africa covers about the same. So it's uh, over here where we are in South Africa. It is now, well, it's five to six in the afternoon. Uh, well, night time now. And then if you were to head further towards the west, if you went all the way across to Western Sahara, you'd probably find that it was three hours behind what we are now. So they would be sitting at about nearly four o'clock in the afternoon, three o'clock in the afternoon. And then, of course, we'd carry on going backwards as we went towards where you are. And you, I think, on the west coast now are probably, sorry, on the east coast, I don't know, I think you're about seven hours behind at the moment. It's nine o'clock in the morning. There we are. Good. OK, let's head back across to Taylor. She's going to try and show you the moon and perhaps Jupiter. We are indeed looking at the moon now. Isn't it beautiful with all of the craters? Now, of course, you might see it shake a little bit, but it's because we're super zoomed in to get this shot. Now, James has asked if we show you Jupiter, which is just to the top and to the left of the moon, and hopefully we'll be able to see it. You have to look for a tiny little star. It looks like a tiny little twinkle in the sky. We're getting there. We're almost there. We should start to see it. Where is it? There it is. It's very faint. I don't know if you can see it. It's starting to get brighter. It's getting brighter and brighter. Now, Jupiter is actually the fifth largest planet in the solar system. So it's really, really, really big. And it doesn't look like it's very big, but that's because it's very far away from Earth. The moon is much closer. And can you believe it? that Jupiter has got over 67 moons. Isn't that crazy? Now we can't see them with the naked eye. I think you can see a couple of them if I'm not mistaken. If you look very, very closely with a telescope. What was coming off of that? Did you see that? Is it another little flickering light? Oh, I think it could just be a glare. I don't think that those are anything. Uh, for a minute I thought maybe it was a satellite going past. And if you look up in the night sky, when you don't have an almost full moon like we've got now, you get to see so many stars, a whole Milky Way, and as well as a couple of satellites. Now, Karen, you're wondering how far can an owl see? My goodness, I don't know, they've got very big eyes though, so I'm sure that they can see relatively far. But the animals out here don't just use their eyes. So an owl will sit very quietly perched on a branch, looking around, listening. So they'll use their super hearing as well as their eyesight as a combination. And that way they'll be able to spot something. Normally what happens is that they hear a noise. They might hear the grass break. They might hear a twig break. Like we, with that scrub here that we saw, as it was nibbling on the grasses, it would hear that. It would swoop down super silently, snatch up its prey, and then take it somewhere else to go and eat it. So that's very cool, don't you think? Let's see what else we can find. We don't have very long to go. But I would love to find you something really cool. Who knows what could be up ahead. Now, Murray, you're wondering what the most common owl is in Africa? I would have to say a spotted eagle owl. We see them all over the country. We actually see them here too. But my favorite owl is a smaller owl. It's not quite, oh, a little bit smaller than a spotted eagle owl, but it is an African wood owl. And they've got the most hilarious call. It sounds like, do, 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 do,
do, do, do, do, do. sounds like they're laughing at you really that was a very poor attempt of that owl's call but maybe next time I'll be able to play it for you now we're running out of time but for the two schools that have joined us today I hope you enjoyed this afternoon safari we got to see lots of different creatures hippos chameleons all those types of wonderful things and I hope that you learned a lot too maybe you can go home this evening and tell your parents all about the fun day at school you've had but for everybody else it's been great and we hope to catch you all soon and we'll be of course in the same place same time for the sunrise safari